Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Brittany, it's good to sit down with you again. It has been a minute since we last talked. Back in, I'm not even going to say what year it was, but we were filming and we had an opportunity just to sit down with you and talk about your experience in the porn industry. And um, it's been amazing just to watch your journey coming out of the industry. And even just since the time that we interviewed, like everything that's been going on in your life. So I'm super grateful to sit down with you, to catch up and to get an update and also dig into some of those things that we discussed in our interview about the industry. Yeah, I'm excited too. I know it's been a while. I saw you, um, your page on Instagram and I'm like, oh, I wonder what he's up to. So it's really cool to now be here with you again. And um, I'm really blessed by everything that you're doing with Exodus Cry. I just think it's so amazing. You're making so much, like such a dynamic difference. And I'm just grateful to just be in the room with you. You guys are awesome. Likewise, likewise. So at one point, so with the last time we talked, you had come out of the industry pretty fresh. And uh, and your interview was very powerful. It's featured in Beyond Fantasy, our series on the porn industry. Very illuminating of certain things going on in the industry, which we'll get to. Um, tell me a little bit just about kind of what has gone on with you since then. I know at one point you were working for Triple X Church. Now you're running your own organization. Could you just give us a bit of a update? I'd love to just yeah, here. Yeah. So since uh, since the last time we met, I am now um, married with two beautiful little girls. Uh, my husband. Well, we're both ad- ordained pastors, um, and we wrote a couple books through Love Always Ministries. We did have Triple X Church for a little while, and now we have LoveAlwaysMinistries dot com. So right now, like God just has us in the lane of helping people find victory over pornography. Um, also to like pursue purity of heart. I didn't know, like I had fallen in love with the word purity and I didn't, or not the word, but just purity in general, not knowing that the church had such a big like misconception and there was this cancel of purity culture. And I'm like, no, you just were taught that purity meant no sex before marriage, no masturbation, no this, no that, but it's a heart condition. Yeah. So purity is actually really beautiful if you know what it means. And so God has us in that lane of like redefining purity. And then we also get to help different industry workers that I've been connected with for years that have wanted to make the transition out of porn. So we've helped a few of those. And it's just been incredible to see what God is doing because we've only, we started our ministry uh, just about a year ago now. Okay. Okay. I love that you're touching on that aspect and it's something that, you know, has been part of our journey as well is like this idea of like, how do we, how do we understand our sexuality, um, in those, you know, in, in those terms of pure versus, versus impure is kind of the, the idea behind purity culture, which I think more people are taking exception to. So um, I've never heard it stated exactly like you just said it, which I think is is helpful and clarifying um, to deal with some of the shame around sexuality. Um, we, we stopped using the language of purity because I think we meant something by that, but it was interpreted through the lens of some of the more toxic aspects of like purity culture. So let's just wrap about that for a second. Cause I think that's a, a cool point to kind of just bring some clarity to. So what the term that we started to use was um, this idea of like sexual integrity. What I took exception to with this term purity was the idea that there are pure versus impure and um, or this idea that uh, you're pure because you're a virgin. Uh, you know, virginity is something that can be taken from you. Integrity is not. And so I, for me, I felt like just providing more clarity around terminology for that was a helpful thing to kind of frame that subject matter because there 
is historically been just so much shame around the subject of sex, specifically within faith communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I agree. And I actually like that you say that sexual integrity, because that's not a term that we've used, but I definitely want to to take that one from you because that is really good. Um, but yeah, when we talk about purity, I mean, Jesus teaches that the Pharisees, that they cleanse the outside of the cup, right? But what does he say? We need to first clean the inside of the cup. And so purity to us, the word in itself means to be uncontaminated. Um, and everything that you do flows from the condition of your heart. So if your heart's contaminated, and that can be with anything, with bitterness, with anger, with hurt, with jealousy, then your actions are going to flow from that place. And so when your heart's been cleansed, not perfection, you, you're not, we're never going to be perfect, but purity is the pursuit of Jesus. And so when we're pursuing Jesus and he cleanses us with his presence, then all then our actions flow from that place, from this place of, you know what, the Lord has healed my heart. And so now I'm I'm operating from a whole heart versus from a broken heart. That's so good. Talk about um, your journey a little bit from the standpoint of, at one point you were uh, a performer in the porn industry and then you became a, a pastor. I don't I, Wild, I, don't, huh? I don't think that that most people think of um, a background in porn as like the kind of like prerequisite kind of like you know yeah. um, grounds for becoming a pastor. So help talk us through some of that journey for you of like where you were at during that time that you were in pornography and then how you've come to kind of where you are today. So when Jesus died on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. And when I was deep in my sin, I needed that word. I needed forgive them, Father, because Brittany does not know what she's doing. Forgive her. Um, and I needed that so desperately because that's why purity is such like a big topic for us because my heart was impure because I was broken and I was shattered. And so all, what I was trying to do was just find anything to numb the pain that was in my heart, right? That's why I turned to drugs. I turned to alcohol. I turned to the porn industry because in my own home life, I didn't hear the words, I love you. You know, you're beautiful. Beautiful. I'm proud of you. Like there was a lot of verbal, emotional, and physical abuse. So when the porn industry was like, you are beautiful, you are going to be a star. We love you. It was like, what you don't get at home, you'll look for in the outside world. And I found it there. I found a sense of belonging. Everybody wants to feel like they belong and like they're accepted. Right. And I found that in the porn industry, um, for a short period of time. So the allure of it, for you was that it was meeting this unmet emotional need. Um, would you describe that as maybe just feeling a bit empty from your growing up experience? Or oh yeah, how I was depleted. Like I wasn't just empty. I mean, I was, I was, I was, comp yeah, I was depleted. I was drained. Um, and that's why I had turned to drugs and, and alcohol and the porn industry because it felt like something was finally feeding my soul. You know, um, I just heard somebody say that there's a cross shaped hole in all of our hearts that only Jesus can fill. Right. And so it's like, like, it wasn't until I came into relationship with him that he started healing my heart and healing that brokenness. Um, and I was able to operate from, from that whole place now, you know, mm -hmm. Specifically, what do you think it was? Because I'm, I'm trying to think of like, right now, OnlyFans has become a really big part of our culture. And I know that there's this increasing um, seduction into sort of a prostitution lifestyle in our culture. And it's everything from Instagram to OnlyFans, to the porn industry, to sugaring, to, you know, uh, just overt prostitution. Is there, is there something that you can maybe help explain from your own experience that some of these other vulnerabilities, I guess, that these other girls might be dealing with and don't have an understanding to even interpret their own experience? Yeah. I guess I'm just I'm concerned for the larger demographic of young women out there who may be in a similar situation to the one that you found yourself in. 
a bit empty and isolated at home, looking for something that they hadn't yet discovered in life. And then here come the like false promises of yeah. OnlyFans or, you know, whatever it is. What is that? There's a lot. And so I think that it, it often starts in in the home life, whether there's an absent father or there's a lot of emotional abuse and these girls grow up and they don't know who they are. And so they, they start to catch this like aha moment where if I post myself half naked, what my dad didn't tell me, what my mom didn't tell me, like I'm getting that from these men. Um, and and they're getting praised, like, and they're being affirmed and they're finally feeling like, oh, this is like, this is where I belong. Because, you know, like my husband always says, like compliments brings confidence, right? And I think that these people like that are posting, um, they have so much brokenness that they're just looking for somebody to make them feel confident. Um, it's really an identity issue of not knowing who they are. And then there's also the issue of if some of these women might have been taken advantage of, whether they were raped or molested or they gave their self away to, to somebody and that person crushed their heart. Well, now they want to take the power back. You know, they want to, like, that's why women go into strip clubs and that's why with OnlyFans, you have full control. Nobody can hurt you because you're the one that's in control. And so there's also, like, um, I think that oftentimes people kind of operate that, like, sub subconsciously of, like, let me take my power back. I've been hurt, so let me, let me take that back. Mm. So pulling back just a little bit, I think for us as humans, we have these like really core needs, of course, food, water, air, I mean, just survival, but then there's like emotional and psychological, intellectual needs that we have and physical and sexual. And there's these different needs. As we grow up, part of the, there's, there's the hope, the expectation that many of those needs, especially the emotional needs, will be met within the context of the home. And in the absence of that, I guess there's just this greater vulnerability to reach out to have those needs met in ways that are unhealthy. And, um, and I think of, you know, just the idea of like wanting to be seen wanting to be cherished, wanting to be affirmed, wanting to find your identity in some semblance of a family structure, wanting to, um, yeah, I think just those, those aspects of, of, of what it means to be human. In your experience, how would you say that, you know, just, I think just to even elaborate a little bit more on, on how the predatory, because one of the things we talk about a lot is the predatory recruitment tactics of the porn industry. Mm -hmm. And so, how and in what way did the porn industry recruiters kind of prey on that? And then where do you see the aspect of like drugs and alcohol fitting in? Because there's a very real pull, I think, for those of us who have experienced some kind of emotional deprivation growing up, there's that pull to self-medicate. Yeah. Okay. And like, this will just make it all feel better or this almost escaping into this intoxicated state of mind where you have this kind of euphoric buzz or, or whatever, and you don't have to really face or deal with those painful, lonely aspects of um, that emotional deprivation. So where for you do you feel like, if you could just elaborate on some of maybe the more predatory recruitment tactics of the porn industry, and then where maybe alcohol or drugs also contributed to part of kind of your journey into the industry? So the porn industry found me when I was 18 years old um, and I was in a strip club. So, I mean, that I, I don't know if they were out there looking for women that night because they were based out of LA and at that time I was living in Santa Barbara. Um, and they just pretty much told me everything that I wanted to hear. And then they told me, we make romance movies. So if you're ever interested, give us a call. Um, I don't know if they were trying to trick me. I knew that they were talking about porn. But for me, I had already been taking my clothes off for money. Um, and I was already promiscuous. So I kind of felt like I was just going to take it one step further. But getting into the industry where they really played as like predators was I was 
I had just turned 18 in April and I was in the porn industry in September that very year. I look back and I was so young, like so young, so naive, didn't know what I was doing. And my first several scenes, like they were like, let's, you know, put you in pigtails and, you know, plastic jewelry and these plastic earrings, like super bright, colorful, like things that I would dress my four-year-old in, like not things, you know, that an 18-year-old wear, wear with a teddy bear and a lollipop and, um, you know, saying things like I'm barely 18 because legally you're supposed to say that so that it, because then you're not actually 16. But but they played on, on you know, molestation. They played on these things, you know, they were pairing me with old men where I got to the point after doing, I did several of those scenes, but I told my agent, like, I can't do this anymore. Like I, and I wasn't a woman of conviction back then. I pretty much, because it was so strict in my household growing up, I just like, I went wild and I had very little convictions, but I had a conviction on that. And I said, I can't do this anymore. These types of scenes, no more pigtails. Like these are encouraging pedophilia and I don't want to be a part of this. Like I actually, the first few tattoos that I got, I got those before I talked to my agent in hopes that, oh, she has a tattoo on her ankle. We're not going to use her anymore. Oh, there's a barbell on her arm. Like I was trying to make myself look older so I didn't have to do those types of scenes. Well, I remember just to your point about look, being able to look back now and be like, man, like looking back now, I, I realized how young I was. Like I, I remember at 19 years old, I had a boss and um, where I was working and, and I, I felt this enormous pressure at 19 years old to have my whole life planned out. And the fact that I didn't at 19, I just felt like I was so behind. Like, how will I ever catch up to what it means to be an adult at this point? Like I, 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 I'm 19. Like in my mind, I, you know, most kids in high school were figuring this out when they were 17, you know, or whatever the thought. And I remember my boss saying this thing to me. He's, he's like, you're just a kid. And, and, and at the time I just thought you're so out of touch. Like you have no idea like what, like, and I'm so old, you know, like, and we know it all at that age or we should know it all. Right. Totally. <laughs> and now looking back and going, man, like 18, like you are a kid. Like it's such this, it's, I, it's maybe one of our most vulnerable ages. I've worked in retirement homes before, like assisted living, uh, nursing home type environments, yeah. you see the vulnerability of like the elderly and the way they can be taken advantage of. Um, I have kids, I, you know, I've, I've had the experience of working with children and you see their vulnerability. So I, I think I've, I have like a good perspective of, you know, and just with the work that we do and stuff of just kind of the full scope of life. And, um, there's something just really uniquely vulnerable about this period of time after you graduate high school, yeah. 18, 19 years old, where you're in this like transitional season of life. And there's all this pressure to suddenly be an adult, suddenly have it all figured out. And um, it really bothers me that the, that it's legal for 18 year olds to join the porn industry. Right. It's you, there's there's clearly some kind of conscious recognition of a certain maturity that should come with the responsibility of drinking alcohol yeah. or renting a car. So we have made it, you know, in our laws where you can't drink legally until you're 21 years old. You can't rent a car until you're 25 years old. And there's some kind of scientific backing for that as well, just in terms of like just the neurological development of our brain and the judgment center of our brain, but also just the emotional maturity aspect. So there is some conscious recognition of the vulnerability of that age. We say, you know, as a society, like it's probably better to wait a few more years to kind of let yourself mature before you start taking on a responsibility that could have like consequences for you. But, oh, you want to go into the porn industry? No problem. Yeah. And then the, and then the pornographers really with the exception of, you know, a few, 
don't have any conscience about, well, maybe we should stay away from, you know, those that are a little bit younger and prioritize finding girls are 20. It, no, there's this huge kind of emphasis on recruiting girls who are at this young, vulnerable age who, I mean, I'm going to sound old saying this, but they're kids. Yeah. And, and, and they will recruit them for the purpose that you mentioned about being able to appear in this barely legal genre of pornography and sell the fantasy of, you know, that goes along with that. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah. I just was, <laughs> yeah, I just it's kind okay. of stirred something I mean, something there's in reasons me they do that. It, it's some of the most sold porn scenes are young girls and old men, teeny boppers, you know, dressed up in the pigtails and the schoolgirl uniforms and all of that. And that sells, that sells. And I was in the industry before Pornhub was around. So there wasn't much free porn. It was like, you had to pay for it. And those were the scenes that, that had the highest return turn rate. Mm. So people capitalize on that. And then another thing that really devastates me is they know that it's a problem because women that enter the age, enter porn at the age of 18, they don't stay around long. They do a handful of scenes and, and they say the turnover rate at that age is so high. Yeah, because you're abusing a child. You know, most girls aren't going to stay in the business once they experience what it's really like. Um, and so it is a very high turnover rate. Can you talk about the aspect of having, you know, a sexual scenario, something as vulnerable as that captured and put on film and the psychological effect of that? In my observation, it seems like that almost has its own kind of ball and chain with it that the porn industry uses. In other words, well, now that you've done this, now that this is out there, therefore, and, and it kind of becomes almost this self-predicting or self-fulfilling prophecy where it's like, now because you've done this, you should do this, this, and this, or you should do this for over this period of time. And it, and so even for somebody who, let's say at 18, at this vulnerable age, maybe thinks they want to try this on, like, I'm going to try this out. Um, those vulnerabilities of, of that age are exploited. They end up in a situation where they are um, experimenting in pornography and at that point, even if they were to say, okay, this isn't for me, well, then there's that perspective of, well, now this is out there. Yeah. Can you talk about in your experience, like, was there a, an, some kind of psychological shift that happened for you? Like, would you say like the before and after that moment of, of having something on camera for the first time? Um, yeah, I, for me, I just think that like, I never had an issue with transition. Like, right, I mean, I moved out of my parents' house at 17 and then went to college, you know, once I turned 18. Went from college in the strip club to the porn industry. And so it's like there was never a problem with me transitioning, you know. Um, but once I shot porn, I, I, I remember seeing something on the news about a teacher getting fired for posting lingerie on, I think it was like MySpace. This was so long ago. And I just thought, wow, like I'm stuck in this business because I have porn out here now and like nobody's ever going to hire me. I'm never going to be able to find a job outside of the porn industry. So I just believe this lie of like, I made my bed and now I have to lie in it. Like this is, this is the destiny that I have to follow for the rest of my life. And I honestly, for many years believed that. Um, and I thought I'd be in that industry my whole life. And I would try to picture myself like, Oh, what am I going to do? Is like an old lady. Like, is this even going to be a thing? Like, what am I, you know? And it just, I tried to see myself in that business so far ahead because I honestly thought that I was stuck. Mm. And then I've also heard too of like, 
there's some manipulation that goes on. I, uh, God was with me even when I was in porn. And I don't even know why, because I wasn't like, I had never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. None of that. But like God was, his hand was on me because I've heard some horror stories from women of like, if they say no to their agent, that they won't be allowed to work. Like they get blacklisted. Like their agent, if they, if somebody calls for that particular person, the agent will say, oh no, she's not available, but you can book this person or that person. I never experienced that, but I did hear of women getting like blacklisted for saying no to certain scenes. Mm. This is fast forwarding a bit, but given some of those dynamics of how the psychological impact of being in the porn industry, now that you've crossed that threshold, these videos are out there. And in a way, it, it almost entrenches you into this lifestyle. How did you eventually reach a point where you were able to kind of break out of that and find freedom for yourself? So um, uh, three and a half years, I was doing heroin at this point in the business. Um, I ended up leaving, moving in with my grandma, detoxed, um, went to church, received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, um, and then ended up getting involved with the pimp who got me back into the business for about another three and a half years. Um, but there was one thing that I had those next three and a half years that I didn't have. And I had the Holy Spirit. I started reading the Bible while in porn with a pimp. I remember so many encounters with God after those, during those three and a half years, my last half. There was a day where me and the pimp got in a fight and I he took my phone and I'm just like, I don't even know what I'm going to do. And I just clearly felt the Holy Spirit guiding me through the whole process. Um, I went and grabbed his phone, went downstairs um, outside of the apartment complex. And I was just like, who am I going to call? You know, and the Holy Spirit told me, call your mom. And I'm like, at that time we had a really, really hindered, it was a a toxic relationship. We didn't have much of a relationship. And um, the Holy Spirit told me to humble myself and to call her. And she came and picked me up within 20 minutes, um, helped me get my stuff out of his house. I lived with her for a little bit, got an apartment. Now I'm ha having to go shoot porn again because even though I was making $30,000 a month, I had not a penny to show for it because I had a pimp. And so he had all, all the money. Um, and so I go to shoot a porn scene in Las Vegas. And before I leave for the airport, I heard the Holy Spirit say, bring your Bible. And so I'm on the airplane and I'm reading my Bible and I'm reading Revelation because it was the only book in the New Testament that I hadn't read because it made no sense to me. <laughs> and so I'm just trying to read it and I get to Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. And um, it's a really harsh scripture to read on your way to a porn scene. But I mean, the Bible teaches us that the truth will set us free. And that's kind of what happened. So it says, uh, I have this thing against you. You tolerate that woman named Jezebel. I've given her time to repent. And if she doesn't repent, I'll cast her and her children and everybody that commits uh, adultery along with her into a sick bed. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. I literally started crying on the airplane. And in my heart, I just said, I'm so sorry, God. Like, I didn't know this is what I was doing. Like, I, I'm breaking your heart. And I had this like godly sorrow. And, it, and I felt the voice of the Holy Spirit again, just said, Brittany, this isn't the life that I have for you. The life that I have for you will overflow with so much love, peace, and joy. And if you would just quit the porn industry today, I would bless your life like no man ever could. And so I got to porn, the porn set that day. Um, I had flown in from San Diego and I just started telling everybody about Jesus. I'm like, this isn't the life God has for us. You know, he has a life that's going to overflow with love, peace, and joy. Just every word that the Holy Spirit gave me, I was telling them. And um, I quit the porn industry that day and uh, started going to church. And I mean, I found my strength from God and God alone, to be really honest, during that season. That's so powerful. I remember talking to a survivor of human trafficking once who talked about an experience that she had where uh, she, while she was, you know, living in a home uh, in Las Vegas under the control of a pimp, saw a special come on about another survivor whose name was Annie Lobert. And at this point, Annie had gotten out of trafficking, but they knew each other when they were both in it. And 
so this survivor who's talking to me, she goes, I see Annie on television and she's giving this testimony about what Jesus has done in her life. And she said that she just wept and she began to think in her heart, could you, God, could you do for me what you did for Annie? I think that sometimes we think about freedom from different situations that we find ourselves in as being this uh, linear path. Oftentimes the stories and the testimonies that we give visibility to are very clean. Yeah. Like I was once and then one day God and I was healed and delivered. And and I I think, you know, there are those instances, those occasions, but a lot of times that path towards freedom is more of a circuitous path. And there are so many um, tentacles and complexities when it comes to navigating a system as oppressive as the commercial sex industry. And um, I've always just really appreciated your honesty, talking about your own story and just different stages along the way where you were on that circuitous path, finding your way towards freedom. Thank you, thank you. In just a few decades, porn has invaded the screens of nearly every household with an internet connection. But few people know the truth about the multi-billion dollar industry behind this content. Action! Our documentary miniseries Beyond Fantasy rips the mask off of the porn industry. It takes viewers straight into the belly of the beast and brings them face to face with some of the biggest porn producers and performers as they describe, in their own words, an industry that profits from ethical violation, coercion and abuse. The chances, the risks that they take are the deal that they make with the devil when they come into this business. It's a hard-hitting series that exposes the porn industry like no other film, but keep in mind that it does include the use of blurred porn video clips, so we encourage viewer discretion. You can watch the Beyond Fantasy series for free on YouTube or at beyondfantasy.com. Something that like, I would love to ask you about is... Uh, this idea of like how you have come to find a place of such contentment and you radiate health and wholeness and um, and like you have this like deep peace and contentment now and you know on what, so I think that by virtue of the culture that we live in it's difficult for a lot of people to believe that they can find that, that place of wholeness because of things we've encountered, because of things we've experienced. And, um, and I'm just curious from your perspective, like how you've been able to work through some of the issues that come along with, let's say, sexual brokenness um, and how you've been able to kind of repair and heal those parts of yourself to be at this place today of be, having such confidence, having such, you know, contentment and peace and health within yourself? Um, I mean, I, I like to say there's there's a scripture, I, I can't remember where it is, that says that the Holy Spirit is the counselor, right? And I really took that to heart. Like when I started growing in my relationship with the Lord, like I had some like really ugly crying moments with God. And and people ask me, like, how did you get healed? You didn't go to counseling. And I don't know counseling. I think it's amazing. But the Holy Spirit really counseled me. Like, there was a moment where he told me, Brittany, there's a broken little girl inside of you. I want you to go, and I want you to look in the mirror, and I want you to encourage that 8-year-old girl. I want you to encourage that 12-year-old girl. And I'm looking at myself just speaking life, encouraging that little girl that wanted to commit suicide. When I was 12 years old, I used to cry myself to sleep, wanting to take my life. And I was encouraging her, like, there's going to come a day where you're going to meet Jesus. You need to just hang on. And um, God really, my relationship with God is, is what brought me to where I am today. He walked me through a healing journey, um, but I had to be willing to be obedient. I remember one time him telling me to flush my drugs down the toilet when I first started going to church. And you know, he miraculously healed me of drug addiction. And then I remember just like him telling me that 
shouldn't date anybody for an entire year and that I needed to grow in him. And so I took a year off of dating and um, I wanted to practice celibacy, no sex before marriage, sexual integrity. Um, but I had to, when he spoke, I'd listen. The Bible teaches us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And one thing that God gave me on that airplane that day was the gift of faith. And um, I just kept believing in him for miracles. I kept believing in him for healing and restoration and redemption. And that's what he's done. And I mean, I think taking that year off to really heal really helped me as well. Because like, even like coming into... <laughs> Uh, when my husband and I got married and it was our night to be intimate, I swear I was so nervous. Like mm. it was like, I'd never had sex before. Mm. I was just like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Oh my gosh. It'd been like three years. Right. And I, I was nervous because the Lord restored my innocence and purity. And that's something that only God could do. Only God can take you back to a place before you ever knew what it was like to be broken, before you ever knew what it was like to be rejected, before you ever knew what it was like, before that person walked out on you. Like only God can do these things. And that's what he did for me. Like he really, truly healed my heart where I truly felt like a new creation. Oh, so much to unpack. This is, thank you for opening up on, about that. That's that's really powerful to hear. Um, it's interesting, you know, I, one of the things that I appreciate about our shared Christian faith is this concept of grace. The idea that salvation is not something that we earn, it's a gift that is offered to us and that our job is to receive that. And um, so there are different passages of scripture that jump out this idea that, that um, this passage of scripture that says, we all like sheep have gone astray, every single one of us, or we all have fallen short of the glory of God. Um, it's this idea that all of humanity has turned away from God in different ways, mm -hmm. in different times of our life. And, um, and it's the grace of God that, um, invites us to come back to that place of fellowship with him as our father in heaven, as the creator of this, of this world and finding our true identity, um, in our creator as a son or as a daughter of God. But I think that even with that knowledge in mind that we all like sheep have gone astray, even with that, there's something there's a lie that I think that we struggle with as humans when we have stepped outside of the grace of God in our lives, when mm -hmm. we have experienced some kind of sexual brokenness. And the lie is, okay, well, maybe, you know, we can believe that God has forgiven us, but it's almost like this thing that we hold on to that where we don't offer ourselves that same forgiveness yeah. of like, I think of the woman at the well, you know, like if you only knew this one thing about me, you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't be here. And then Jesus is like, you know, if you only knew yeah. the gift of God and he's like, you've had five husband. He's like, God's already made provision for that. And he responds to that sense of personal shame with this overwhelming, extravagant message of love and forgiveness and acceptance. Yep. It's such a hard thing for us to work through that, that place of self-forgiveness and self-compassion and truly being able really to receive the the forgiveness of God, not just as a doctrinal truth or spiritual reality, but in reality, uh, in the inner recesses of our own soul and mind and heart. Was there a moment for you, or maybe it was a process where you felt like you started to to be able to kind of work through that of like your own, accept, forgiving yourself? So... 
I knew that I was forgiven and there wasn't much that I, I don't know, like it was just this, honestly, it was the grace of God. Now, as I walk with God longer, there have been times where I've like beat myself up a little too much. But in those beginning stages, it was just like, I knew I was forgiven. My big thing was, was shame. Um, and I, I knew that I was forgiven but I was ashamed of my sin. And I felt like, well, everybody at church is so perfect. You know, nobody's going to love me. If they find out what I've done, they're going to, they're going to kick me out of church. And I think that was more shame. It it was like, I knew I was forgiven, but, um, the Holy Spirit walked me through that as well. Um, I remember praying because I had done, I had shared my testimony for a ministry thinking it was just going to be shared at these porn shows. And little did I know they were going to put it on YouTube and it was going to go viral. And I was just like, oh no, everyone's going to see this. How embarrassing. And um, the Holy Spirit just said, can you picture Jesus on the cross? And I said, yes. And he said, um, can you picture the crown of thorns, every beating that he took for you? And I said, yes. And he said, um, was that enough for you? And I said, well, yeah, that was more than enough. And he said, then why are you ashamed of the very thing that Jesus died for you for? Go and be set free, daughter. Like He literally said that to me. And when I heard him say that, it was like this weight got lifted off of me. And I actually went to church a few days later and was like, I used to be a porn star, but Jesus Christ set me free. Isn't he so? And I was just telling everybody and I'm just like, oh my gosh. (laughs) I look back and that was probably some people were probably like awkward (laughs) because I was just so free. I wanted to tell everybody at that point. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's that that level of freedom is so threatening yeah. to the religious spirit. Oh, it is. That yes. needs to earn its salvation, right? Mm-hmm. And the extravagant love of the Father just shatters that religious spirit. And he uses those of us who are have been the most broken as the, you know, as the the royal diadems, like the the precious jewel to show forth his beauty and his grace and his redemption. And I just I think it's just so incredible. I think it's yeah. so powerful. And one of my favorite moments in any film that we've created was at the end of Nefarious when so many survivors begin to share that encounter with the love of God that just completely transformed their lives. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's one of the most beautiful things is God's ability to take our, take us from you know, take our ashes and and turn them into something so beautiful. And it's just so incredibly profound. Um, You are doing a lot now in this space of educating people about pornography. What what would you say is kind of like your primary message? Um, For me, I just want people to know that number one, there's freedom in Jesus. Most of the addicts that we talk to are so ashamed of their sin. It's that hidden sin that they they feel comfortable telling us because we're open, um, but they won't tell anybody else. And there's just such a stigma attached to it. And I mean, if you look at the statistics, it's like 30% of women in church watch porn, 70% of men in church watch porn, and 50% of pastors and leaders in church watch porn. And so 50% of pastors are battling with porn then they're also silent about it. And that's why we don't really, I don't know about you, but I personally haven't heard very many porn messages in churches. Um, And yet people are struggling. And so I just want people to know that, that you don't have to be ashamed. Like that's not where Jesus wants you. He wants you to get open so that you can get free. Um, And, and then also just raising awareness. I think that so many people don't understand how toxic porn is, especially when you've been watching it for a while, I just had to report somebody as a pedophile the other day because of the comments they were making um, against my children about when are we going to see your girls in porn? And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, but, but what porn does is that it, um, it makes you think that perversion is normal. It makes you think that it's okay that everybody's talking like that, right? And so, it, because you see those things in the porn scene, so now you think like, oh, it's okay to have these types of open conversations. Um, and they don't realize like how toxic porn is. So I also am really big on like sharing my my personal experiences because I want people to see the toxicity. Um, you know, it's, it's painted this 
pretty glamorous picture with all the beautiful lights and fish islands, camera, everything. You know, you get all these things and you're watching the final product, but you're not watching the broken performers that are pounding back bottles of alcohol. The girl that almost didn't finish the scene, but was told she wasn't going to get her paycheck. So even though she was crying, she had to suck it up and go back and, and do the scene. So uh, just sharing, sharing the, the real brokenness so people can see that it is toxic. One of the things that I so appreciate about you just being so open about your story now and the work that you and your husband are doing is that it creates a safe place for people who may not open up in other contexts to be vulnerable. Because I, I feel like vulnerability is one of the true keys to finding freedom from pornography. Uh, when we're not able to be vulnerable is, is when that cycle of compulsive consumption really takes a hold and, and makes it difficult to come out from. Mm. There's nowhere where you can just open up that feels safe. And, um, and because shame is such a part of it, it just, it keeps us silence. It keeps us hidden. We just recently released, a, a film or did a premiere for a film called buying her, which is the story of male sex buyers and these men open up their lives to us and share their entire story in a way that has this effect of welcoming other men into a vulnerable space because some of these guys had gone so far that even for the person at home who thinks, you know, I'm this awful, whatever thoughts they're battling with, of shame, they look at that person, they go, oh, well, I haven't done that. So yes. let me come and, and open up, you know? That's part of the reason and, uh, I'm so open. <laughs> I, I, th I think you're- I'm like, come on, you're obviously forgiven. I'm forgiven. So you must be forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I think it just, it, it's so, it's yeah. disarming in the, yeah. in the way that it, it's, if, if somebody is battling with their, ability to forgive themselves or to become vulnerable or to open up or to face that they even have a struggle or anything and they hear your story it i think it, it does have that effect of being like if she's able to be so open and so transparent about her own journey what am i you know what am i doing over here and so i i really appreciate that that you guys are facilitating a conversation that just historically has not been around in in the church, and um, and it's yeah, it's a huge, huge thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I want to go back just a little bit into kind of I think some of your observations of the dynamics at work in the porn industry, and I'd love to ask you about your own personal critique of the porn industry, now having some years to look back and observe those dynamics. Uh, at the time that we were deeply investigating the porn industry, there were a few things that stood out to us. Uh, first was these two genres that, you know, I think these two genres of barely legal and like violent gonzo pornography yeah. are like umbrella genres that then house a lot of subgenres. So for example, in the barely legal, there's also, you know, uh, incest porn and there's a, a whole bunch of things that go underneath that banner subgenres. Yeah. Yeah. But these two pillars, these two major genres that were also two of the most popular genres of all time were really concerning to us from the standpoint of promoting fantasies of, that were essentially criminal fantasy that are having sex with a child or just the mark promoting the fantasy of like pure violence. And then there was the third episode, which was another kind of thing that we observed in the industry, the reckless uh, approach to dealing with STIs or STDs. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm curious in your experience and now having some time to reflect if you could speak into what you, some of the 
dynamics that you observed in the porn industry that maybe you were oblivious to at the time or maybe n- just not fully aware of at the time, but now you can look back and see, oh, now I can see that this was happening or that was happening. Is there anything like that for you where when you talk about this issue, you can help shed light on some things about the porn industry that most people like just don't know? Yeah. So um, as far as like, yeah, I've, I've definitely seen like um, in Gonzo where they set up like the scenarios of like uh, the babysitter and um, the, uh, the babysitter with the kid, the, you know, the quote unquote kids. And then it's like the parents come home and then everybody's doing like a big orgy kind of thing. And so I've definitely seen that. Um, and that kind of stuff, like the mom and the daughter and the dad and the daughter and stuff like that. I've, I've definitely, and I've been a part of those scenes and with like the abuse, um, there were scenes where my agent would say, you know, the scene is going to be rough. And so I'd say, well, you know, if they can tack on an extra like 200 bucks, I'll do it. Um, and so one of those in particular, I remember like, after I finished, like it was really, really rough. Like I, I was hurting during the scene. Um, and after the scene was finished, like I had hair and I wasn't wearing extensions. It was my real hair all over the bed from it being pulled so hard, um, and just being choked and spit on and, um, all the things. So, um, and then there's also like the BDSM scenes. Uh, there's a big one out in San Francisco. Uh, and those ones, I mean, I remember, like them tying me to like an upside down cross at one point and just like, you know, flogging you and flogging me. Um, Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of abuse. And at the time I didn't look at it as like, like I told you, I had very little convictions in that industry. Um, And I didn't look at those abusive scenes like, Oh, this is what I'm encouraging. But now that I look back, I feel bad because I've heard things from like, you know, young boys wanting to have sex with their girlfriends, like teenage boys, and them, you know, seeing porn scenes like that and going and like trying to slap the girl and pulling her hair and wanting to spit on her because this is what they were taught is healthy and normal because they learned it from porn. Um, And then the girl just never wanting to have sex again because she's, you know, sexually traumatized. Um, And so, yeah, I I didn't realize how many teenagers even. I I hate to say it, but teens do watch porn. I mean, 12-year-olds watch porn. I I didn't realize how they were turning to it as like sexual education and wanting to use what they were seeing, the abuse and all of that um, in their everyday life. And I, I feel bad about that. One of the things that we explore in that genre is the tactics that are used by the pornographers to get performers to comply with performing in these more violent, uh, hardcore scenes. And one pornographer explained to me that he would tell the performer um, in advance how much they're going to make and that they're going to do such and such vanilla sex scene. And then when they arrived on set maybe halfway through whatever video they were shooting would then flip the script and say, well, now you have to do this or you're not going to get paid. Wow. And, um, and so, so that was, I think for us, just one of the really alarming things about the industry is this dynamic of coercion in getting these performers who are already oftentimes at such a vulnerable age, young, 18, 19, 20 years old, and now adding a very manipulative component yeah. into their experience mm-hmm. to get them not just to have sex on camera, but to perform in sex that was really violent and ultimately damaging to them. Um, is that was that something that you observed as well in 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 your time in your time and your experiences? Some of those coercive aspects at work on the part of the pornographers. Mm-hmm. I I heard of, I've heard of instances like that. Like when I say that God's hand was on me, but I also, I mean, I was pretty willing to do a lot of the more aggressive scenes 
coming from my place of brokenness, I was verbally and physically abused. So for me, it was just kind of like, I'm used to this. You know what I mean? It felt normal. It's normal. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew I didn't like it, but I'm like, oh, whatever, you know? what's another spanking kind of thing. You know what I mean? That's like how, so maybe that's why I didn't have to get tricked into doing those because I mean, I would say yes to them. I would charge more, but I would say yes to them. If for people at home who have a very two-dimensional relationship with pornography, in other words, there's obviously a very large demographic of people who are pornography consumers in our world. Um, and I think a lot of them are, they are trapped in the fantasy and the delusion that the what they see presented on a person's Twitter page or on the, you know, thumbnail of the video represents reality. That yeah. these women are basically there because they're the subclass of human beings who really just enjoy and love being, you know, penetrated by strange men and you know on and on and like and they there's this idea that they like this that they deserve this that they're making money off of this and it's all just it's all i guess feeding themselves this cover narrative to remove that inner wrestle with their own conscience yeah in your experience could you help maybe shed light on kind of the other side of this equation cuz cuz for me you know getting to meet you and other people who performed in the industry, it was definitely a whole eye-opening experience of understanding that the reality of what's going on in porn is so much different than what you per see portrayed in these clips or on a Twitter page, that there was so many, um, yeah, there's just so many layers to what's actually going on in these people's lives and that they are three-dimensional humans. Yeah. So, um, Performers are, I mean, we often use like stage names, right? So it's like you're you're constantly in this character. And if you break your character in front of the public or in front of the porn industry, you're not going to get hired anymore. So if you start opening up about your drug addiction, if you start opening up about how much you hate yourself, how suicidal you are, if you start opening up about um, the abuse and the aggression that happens in porn and you say that you're not okay with it, you're just not going to get hired. And so you have to stay in character and you have to put on this facade like everything is great. And what most people don't understand is that there is a paycheck involved. These women and these men are paid actors. I mean, most men are either taking Viagra or there's some, I don't know what the medicine is called, but you literally put a needle in your penis to make it erect. And it's because porn is so desensitizing. A lot of men can't even, they, they get a erectile dysfunction being in the porn industry. So for them to say, oh, well, the guy had a heart on for an hour, like he must have really enjoyed it. But no, he's medicated down there. He's medicated. Um, and so like you, these people that are watching porn, they do want to believe that it's real because they're enjoying it. But when you start to break that stigma of like, I have literally seen women on set crying with the directors awkwardly looking around while the girl is um, performing oral sex on a man, like just crying because she doesn't want to be there anymore. And they're looking around like, what do we do? Like, should we cut the scene or should we just let her go? Let's just like give it, a I've heard them whispering, let's just give it a few minutes and see what happens, you know? Um, and so you don't see these things because, yeah, they're going to keep it going and then they're going to cut that part out, you know? And so you just, porn's not what it seems. It's, there's a lot of editing. Um, it's acting, directors telling the performers what to do and when to do it, what to say. Um, it's, it's not reality. It really is a fantasy and it's a bunch of actors doing their job. They're acting. The scenario, the scene that you just described is also, I think, one of the things that, that really stood out to me is the lack of an advocate. If you're, because oftentimes the porn industry who identify themselves as the adult industry, the adult entertainment industry, compare themselves to Hollywood. So if you bring up something about any kind of criticism or accountability, well, the well, Hollywood's, you know, doing these violent things and there's, there's always these comparisons, but in, in Hollywood, you know, feature films, there are different people who are advocating for those that are, you have, 
you know, agents that are advocating for you. Now we have intimacy coordinators that are advocating. It's not to say that nothing troubling ever happens on a, on a film set, but it, uniquely in the porn industry where it seems like there should be even more of an emphasis on these performers having advocates, you have situations like you just described where somebody is literally in tears when it comes to something as sensitive and vulnerable as our sexuality. Like it's, it's, that's an area where you want, you need as a human to feel safe. And uh, the idea of like, well, let's just see if she can push through. Yeah. Cl clearly shows a lack of sensitivity for this person is experiencing this as a sexual assault. That's why they're in tears. They're in tears because they're experiencing this as violation. And the fact that there's, you know, really no one there to advocate for them is so alarming to me. I mean, in you, again, in your experience in those, in those situations, I guess my question is just like, you know, the lack of safety is that, was that a feeling that you had when you were on these sets or how, how would you describe that feeling of being in an environment where it doesn't seem like there's really an advocate for you and something as sensitive and vulnerable as. Yeah. So if something like that had happened, I mean, the reality is, is the agents should be advocating, but a lot of the times it's like they're paychecks are on the line too, because if you don't get paid, they're not getting paid. Um, and then they have to go through the whole process of trying to find a new girl. And if they don't find a new girl, then another agent's going to get the job booked because the scene has to, has to be done. Um, and so I think that oftentimes the agents will just kind of throw the like, well, you're not going to get paid if you don't do the scene. And these women, a lot of the women, they're from, they're from out of the States, you know, they're flying in to shoot and they have to leave home with their, with money or, or, you know, everybody needs to make their, make a living. Um, and then also they'll get blacklisted. A lot of agents will do blacklisting. And so, um, I think that they just have to push through. There was one woman in particular who was with my agency at the time when I first started, um, in the porn industry and she had been in porn, left, was an agent, and then ended up getting back into porn later on. But she actually sat me down and was like, and she's tried to even advocate for the for industry workers since leaving the porn industry again, but they pretty much just kind of shut her down. Um, but she would tell me like, you don't have to say yes to everything. Did you know that you don't have to work like, look at, look at your schedule. You've worked 73 days in a row. Did you know that you don't have to work this much? Did you know that you can take a day off? Um, did you know that you can have a no list? In fact, did you know that you could have a yes list? Like, because before I was just working with any guy. And so she was one woman and I've never experienced, encountered anyone like her who actually told me that I had a voice. Because before that, I thought that I had to say yes to everything that I had signed up for. Um, and I didn't know that I could say no. Mm. Well, as we talk about, you know, these, these different dynamics in terms of how the porn industry functions and operates, it's, um, I think that it's, you know, the thought, just going back to our previous conversation, the thought of an 18-year-old entering into that space is just, it's, it's just so troubling to me. Yeah. And yet we are in this culture right now where there's this image-based culture and there's such an emphasis put on, for women, on finding their value in their sex appeal. And I think that really lends itself to empower the efforts of predatory pornographers, strip club owners, those who would profit from OnlyFans. Um, and so just recognizing that reality right now in our culture and given everything that, that you've been through and, and you're more like, and just your perspective now that you have, what would you say to, what is your message to young women who are kind of in the wrestle of this culture right now, the, the pressures, the voices that are there and, and yeah, just their own unique vulnerability at that younger age. I mean, we don't have to fall into the pressures of this world, you know, and I wish, 
I wish that I knew who I was when I was 18 years old. I wish that I knew who I was because when you don't know who you are, you're going to lack boundaries. And when you don't set boundaries, you will tolerate things from people and you'll tolerate situations that that are not acceptable. Um, but when you don't know who you are, you'll tolerate the abuse. When you don't know who you are, you will take your clothes off and pose provocatively. You will sell yourself on OnlyFans because you don't know your identity. You don't know how valuable you truly are. Um, and so, yeah, I think that just, I mean, I just want to encourage every young woman to, to really build on, on your relationship with Christ. It's like, that's, that's the overflow of my heart. Like, like if you can just find yourself in God, you're going to have so much confidence. You're going to set boundaries. You're going to learn to say no. You're not going to let people abuse you. You're not going to let people take advantage of you because you know who you are. And that kind of confidence can only come from, from a relationship with God. Where have you and your husband seen the most success in the ministry that you guys are doing around this issue of helping people who have struggled in, in, with pornography? I think in, in sharing my story, I think that we have seen and just sharing like my experiences, just being raw and being vulnerable. We've seen, um, I mean, we get emails daily of people just saying like, like, thank you. Like I, I, I've been going through this alone. I feel like I can finally start opening up or other people saying, Hey, I stopped watching porn after hearing what you've been through. Um, and so right now I feel like there's just this um, an anointing on just being honest, you know, like just being transparent. I think like when we try to sugarcoat our experiences, like performers, when we, when we sugarcoat our experiences in the porn industry, then we're not, we're not giving people the ability to get set, set free because it's, it's the transparency that's bringing people freedom. And so, um, yeah, I, I have found a lot of confidence in sharing, I, in the past, I'd be like, oh, I don't know if I could share that, especially not in the church. No, it needs to be shared because if 70% of men, 30% of women, 50% of pastors and leaders are battling with it, then they need to know how dark the porn industry is. Um, and so, yeah, I found a lot of encouragement in that because I've seen so many people get set free from porn just by being honest. Because sometimes like if you don't know how bad you're hurting somebody by supporting it, then why are you going to stop supporting it? a really helpful perspective and way to think about it. Um, I would imagine that by virtue of you now being a pastor, your husband is a pastor, that you probably have um, interaction with more leaders than, than most of us do. And um, in your experience, would you say that this issue is something that, that, you see a lot of struggle with among leaders as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, gosh, the stories we hear are really, really devastating because I think I always want to believe that if you're, because I don't know, I just have this conviction. If you're going to take on a, a, a title, you have to walk worthy of the call that was placed on your life. And a lot of people don't have that conviction. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are okay. Like, I mean, I've heard of leaders, high up leaders, like going to massage parlors and um, pornography and adultery. And it's devastating because this is not what the church is supposed to look like. Ravi Zacharias. I mean, that that one just blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. one of them. I mean, I didn't personally know him, but that story was like, whoa, because, wow. yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting to think about that because I think, yeah, there is this expectation that if you are holding a title for a certain position and that you're bearing the responsibility that comes with that, and um, I'm, I'm sure there's a difficulty in like seeing that, but also... I think it destigmatizes this idea that our leaders don't struggle. Yeah. And I'm just glad that you guys are out there and that there's somebody for people to go to that feel safe to say, I shouldn't be struggling. I'm a leader, but I am struggling. What now? Yeah. You know, yeah. and I just so appreciate 
the space that you guys are creating for those conversations to happen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's it's hard. Uh, our heart is really really to help people, but sometimes it's like it's uh, yeah, I mean, you're helping people but at the same time your heart is really breaking, you know? Um so, yeah, we hear and see a lot. Well, I want to wrap this conversation. First of all, thank you again just for sitting down with us again. It's yeah. it's an honor to to catch up with you after all this time. I'm really excited about just, you know, your story being featured in in one of our um documentaries and um and just so encouraged to see kind of where you've come over these past 10 years and the work that you're doing today. Is there anything else that you feel is on your heart to share before we wrap this up? If you haven't checked out Beyond Fantasy, <laughs> let me tell you, what are you waiting for? <laughs> awesome. You need to, you need to, I, I would just encourage people that haven't seen it because I think you guys have done a really good job at showing the dark side of the industry that most people don't get to see. And I mean, it's coming from performers and producers and directors. And so you're hearing it from like firsthand from people that are experiencing it and even still in the business. Um, and so I think that if you haven't, if you haven't seen Beyond Fantasy, especially if you're struggling with porn or know somebody who is, um, it's a great resource. It's a free resource. Um, beyondfantasy.com. You need to check it out. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on with us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at exoduscry.com and join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.